You're listening to the Empowering Process Podcast with your host, Gail Kraft. Listen as she holds frank discussions around how your purpose, being present, and trusting your power impacts your life. Whether you're an entrepreneur, leader, or developing your vision, you'll find wisdom and insights you can utilize right now. Welcome your host, Gail Kraft. Well, hello, everybody. This is Gail Kraft from the Empowering Process Podcast, and I have with me a repeat offender, to tell you the truth, and it's it's Daniel Felt. Daniel owns a business called Kusa. What is it? Yeah, Cura Home. Cura, Cura, like K-U-R-A. Yeah. Cure a home, right? Um, basically anything that your home needs to keep it up and uh, up to shape, they can come and do it. But that's not why we're here. We'll talk about that later. We're here to talk about um, changes in Daniel's life and what it's like to be the child born after a child is lost. And what is it like to have that kind of unconditional love? Well, welcome, Daniel. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's going to be so much fun. And this is this is your second time with me. So this is kind of fun. <laughs> so um, so we were talking and um, your brother was 18 months old and um, definitely devastating to the family. Um, I do want to add that there are um, emotions that are within, it felt within in vitro right? Mm -hmm. And so the the fear um, that your mother was feeling, the sadness that she was feeling, that was part of your your um, incubator phase, quite mm -hmm. frankly, right? So you were being incubated during that, that time. And the fear then of losing you, mm -hmm. right, um, really overshadowed all of the things that she did in raising you and it wasn't you know there was no lack of love for sure right um but decisions and choices are made that were good some not so good and you know some pretty pretty um maybe even ugly so why don't we dive right in daniel and tell us a little bit about and this is the first time that you realized that um you were in the shadow of a death <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't remember exactly as a as a child, but as you, you know, as you grow, and you know, I at the time I, I was the, you know, I have two older sisters and a and a brother right now who are alive, and I have two younger sisters. But it, so as a child being born, like the joke in my family is like we don't we don't have a favorite, but it's Daniel, and and uh, and so looking back as you as you look back at growing up, and it's it's an awesome spot to be. Like how fortunate for me that I got to be that person but my family we we had no money growing up whatsoever as in like my dad's paycheck came on friday morning we went to town we cashed that and we bought groceries i mean it was it was very very tight we we did cry over spilled milk you know it was like now the milk's gone so for us when i was born my parents they they bought a video camera to capture that and i was born in 89 and and just to capture those moments and i look back at all those things and and the way that i was raised it was extremely important because there was an extra like outpouring of love from everyone in, in my my immediate family in my extended family in all these people just a huge outpouring of of extra love and i definitely felt that and it contributes to who i am today even as a 33 year old so um so can you think of some examples where you realized that um Maybe other children weren't receiving the same type, maybe even in your own family, because obviously you were the favorite. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, you know, what's what's interesting about our family dynamic is um, I was born and then my next younger sister was born three and a half years later. And then my youngest sister was born with another major thing of she was born with Down syndrome, which was was fine. But we we immediately found out at about 10 days of age that she had um, leukemia. And that that became a, a several year battle of where we we didn't think she was going to live several times on that. And and so seeing that as as a little bit older, I'm, I'm a, few, a few years older than her, but seeing my family go through that process then was also very dramatic. And and the way that 
my younger sister, like sometimes we, we see that there's like a gap where it was, it's clear that we had to put all of our attention on my youngest sibling in order to make sure that she lived. It was, you know, extremely crucial. I mean, literally life or death. If she was, there was days that I remember my mom, you know, she was there when we went to bed, but when we woke up in the morning, she was gone because there was some, you know, like the white blood cell count dropped so far that she had to race, you know, an hour and a half to the Minneapolis Metropolitan, the children's hospital there. And so seeing that as we grew up, my mom tried to do spe- unique things to get back some of that time. Mm, such you as? Know, and, such as I was homeschooled in sixth grade one year so that we could spend more time together. And she would do with my younger sister there was like special one-on-one little like girls trips, which with when there's six kids in the family to do a one-on-one thing is, is very thing. And, and so to see that, and now as I, as I'm a parent of, of two very young kids, two and a half and six months old, but I like, it all starts to kind of make sense on where she's, where, where, where that's coming from and why she did those things. Right. Right. So, um, so being homeschooled, it's interesting. Um, my son and daughter-in-law um, moved from the west coast to the east coast Mm -hmm. and in that move decided to homeschool the kids one year because they didn't know the school systems they didn't know right they wanted to be sure that they had time to find a good situation for the children Mm -hmm. Um, and if you ask the children today um, what they prefer they will say homeschooling yeah right and and here's why they got to do field trips, which were part of the curriculum, which mm-hmm. meant they got to travel. Yeah. Right. And my grandson was six when he got to spend time in Bora Bora. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's, there's huge advantages um, to it. I, I think what's different today with the amount of programs that are involved today, it's, it's, it's improved so much, even since I was in, in a sixth grader, which now it feels like, I don't know, it's probably like 20 years ago now. And, and so I, I think it's a lot better. I think when I was that age, it was, you, know, you were kind of nerdy. And I think like, it would look at like, maybe some of your social skills weren't, wouldn't quite be developed. And I think today, kids who are being homeschooled and my neighbors, my very close neighbors are, are, they have five kids and they're homeschooling and they have to be some of the most polite children I've ever met in my life. And they are extremely social and they talk the, the, the conversation that I'm having with a 10 year old is like what I, what I would have with like a 15 or 16 year old who's going through the public school system. So they, they, there's a lot of skills that are, they're surpassing in my opinion, kids in the public school system, because there's so much one-on-one attention. I, and maybe my neighbors are really awesome at homeschooling, but their, their kids are really in a phenomenal spot. So that going through that process for me was awesome. Cause I, I opened up a checking account when I was 12 years old and, and, and I had to balance it. You know, I learned how to balance a checkbook. I mean, even life today, skills, wow. yeah, life skills, how to sew a button on like these things that like you, you look back like, Oh, not that big of a deal, but man, let me tell you, there's a lot of people that can't change a tire, change their oil, sew a button, you know, Oh, how do you get a mortgage for a house? Where do you even start? I mean, these, these things that I think the public school system should be teaching but because there's so many things that, you know, you, we need to get all these people ready to go, you know, to be contributors to society. I don't think they focus on some of these one-off things that I feel are very important. So, so let's talk about um, being contributors to society. Okay. So we're going down a path that we, I didn't think we we're going to go down. Um, quite frankly, the public school system has one purpose, and that is to create someone who will take orders. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, is that contributing to society or is that succumbing to a leadership that you may or may not like? I, uh, yeah, so I agree with you hundred percent on this game. <laughs> and, and I love, I actually love that we're talking about it now. So I, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I agree with you because it's, I think when the school system was generated, it really was coming around the time when the United States was, a, was involved in a lot of wars I was getting people just to kind of fall in place too, not only in the war system and, and kind of like go work in a factory. Right. Now with all these robots replacing these people in factories and fast food restaurants, even things like that. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a huge divide between people who have broken off from the system and said, I'm going to read extracurricular uh, books. I'm going to take a field trip to Bora Bora. I'm going to be doing this. 
and that. And I think the wealth gap is going, we're going to see in the next 20 to 40 years, the wealth gap really get wide. I think it's really going to divide the people who are, who have figured it out and they know how to manage a business or, or invest in certain things like real estate, things like that, compared to the people who they, they can't, they just completely trust on the education, ed, educational system to get them where they want to go. Yeah. Um, I actually, you can already see the, the division since um, 2020, right? Mm-hmm. That's when people had the opportunity, number one, to identify that they had a natural rhythm mm-hmm. that maybe did not go, mine is not nine to five. My right. natural rhythm is not nine to five, right? And and a lot of stress that was felt because of nine to five was released, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you see a lot of, my, my son is one of them, a lot of people saying, no, I'm not going back to the office. And right. if you want me to go back to the office, I'll find another job, mm-hmm. right? Um, or I don't want to work for any of you guys, Yeah. right? So I, I'm going to go and build my own Right. And that you'll, there's more and more entrepreneurs. So again, from my perspective, the um, corporations of today, the big businesses of today is an experiment. They didn't exist before the factories, before Ford. Everyone was an entrepreneur, right? Everyone was a solopreneur, right? They took care of themselves and traded with each other, Mm -hmm. right? And then factories came into place and put in a system where these cogs called humans would be put in a row and given one task over and over and over again. So that's when the school systems focused on, right? So here we go. And it was an, it's an experiment and it's failing, mm-hmm. right? Um, which is fine. Expe- that's what life is. It's an experiment. And when it fails, when it falls apart, it's time to look for a different solution right? It worked when it worked and now its season is over. For sure. Right. Um, and so th- you're right. There will be a divide because there'll be those folks who, who can't fathom, well, what does this new life look like? Right. Right. right? And there'll be people who like me, well, well this is going to be exciting. This is going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. I wonder what this is going to be like. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think one one thing that I've in in my like paying attention to this because a lot of people who we employ are in are in their twenties is that these kids right now that are in high school they're assuming that a lot of them will end up having they they won't work anywhere full time they'll have like two to three part time jobs to allow that flexibility so similar to what you mentioned Gail how you you you're not a nine to five person and I, I'm right there with you I. I, I actually call myself unemployable at this point. I can never work for anyone. I love my own hours. I love that I can answer an email at 5 a.m. if I want, 10 p.m. if I want. I usually get to it during the quote unquote normal work hours, but I kind of, I, I do what I want now and that's really fun and it, and it works way better for me. But these um, this next generation that's coming in, their assumption is that if they're not entrepreneurs, which they think 60 to 6, uh, I believe the stat that I read was 68% of them will have some sort of business and or side hustle to make money. And then they'll also have part-time jobs. And I think that it's kind of going to be this, the next step of, I don't want to work nine to five. I do enjoy, I think there is a lot of security in getting a paycheck every week or every two weeks. I think a lot of people do have that and thrive on, on that. And, and then I think also the risk or the like the the dabble and I'm going to have this side gig or this side job that I can do when outside of my quote unquote nine to five. But the big benefit that these people are realizing coming into the workforce is that if I'm a part-time employee, I'm not, I don't have to like ask for PTO or like time off for an event or a holiday or things like that, because I'm not fully committed to this. I'm just here 20 or 30 hours a week. So if I want Christmas Eve and Christmas Day off, guess what? I get it. And and they they just they don't don't put them on the schedule. And what I will also contribute to that is that some of my if I had to like grade my employees and I had to pick favorites, some of my highest income earners per hour when it comes to showing up, getting tips and getting commission, my best guys are the guys who work here part time. They're they're on time every time. They show up when they say they're going to show up and they give it 110%. For my other guys, like if we get a call back, we make a mistake. You want to know what that is? It's like Friday afternoon. It's so predictable. Like, cause they're like, right. they're whining down the tanks on E. And so where these other guys, they give me 110% three days a week. Right, right. So, um, so I've done 
a lot of contract work, right? So, you know, I um, am a coach, I'm also a, a project program manager. And so I will help implement huge programs for organizations. And um, in my eyes, that is not a 40 hour a, 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 a week job. You have a program, right, that you want implemented. I don't do the work. I am a program manager. Mm -hmm. I I will gather the requirements, figure out what resources are needed, and then gather the resources and, and say, bang, go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and then just look for risks and, and manage those kinds of opportunities. So I work two and a half days a week mm -hmm. when I have that kind of contract. Right. And um, it is it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And I've never had the first time I did that. I, it, it was quite a haggle. And um, the woman that hired me needed someone who had enough a variety of skills to help her build what she was building. And, and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I've done that. Yep. I've done yeah. that. Yep. I've done that. Right. Because you do. Mm -hmm. And so she, He's like, well, can you help me build this? I'm like, absolutely. And near the end, because we didn't have an end date, and that was my lesson learned on that. Yeah. Um, in the end, there was no work for me to do, and I would show up, even though it was only two days a week. I'm like, well, I'm wasting my time here. Right. So, you know, I went to her, I said, is there anything else that, you know, left? And she's like, well, you could go to so-and-so and find work. I said, no, I'm, I'm here. If I need to find work, then the contract's done. Right. Right. I'm not an employee. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that kind of life is what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can take the risk like you did and own your own business. Right. And therefore be responsible for sales and generating income. Mm -hmm. Be responsible for HR. Right. And be responsible that your your guys are taken care of, that they have money, that they have health insurance. Right. Um, or you can be the part-time worker who will give it 110%. Because when I showed up, at, at, when I show up at those contracts, I do a five or six day worth of work in those two days. Right. Because that's all I'm doing. Yeah. That's it. Are you right? So, um, so how did we get on this? I, I'll, I'll <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, so. So given this going back to um, being a child of an unusual family, mm -hmm. the time, right? You know, things are changing now, but at the time that you were growing up, that homeschooling was unusual. Mm -hmm. um, given the kind of love that you were given, is was there ever a time where you felt, you know, God, I just need some space. I love you, but God, move out of my way, <laughs> ever. No, I, I think, um, being one of six, you, you know, my parents, I think did a really awesome job raising us and they, they deserve all the credit that they get. And then some, we, when I look at my siblings, I think one thing that is very common amongst us is that we are disciplined people. And, and I think that that is a trait that will set up. And if you can do that for your kids or someone who you're mentoring, uh, help them understand how important discipline is and to do something consistent. And my, my parents, there was a time that, um, you know, I, I keep talking about all these cool things. I, I was a swimmer, another cool, cool thing. Right. And, um, in eighth grade, I, I qualified for sections and, you know, cause it was normal season and then you go to sections. And if you did bad grade from there, you went on to state. And when I qualified for sections, I didn't want to keep on swimming. And I think this is such a unique story because our pool was the chemicals were off in the pool. And for some reason it was, it was like tricky to breathe. Like it, like it was fine. You could still swim in it. But like when you're out of breath, we were like, you'd kind of cough and I would come home and I would tell my parents and, and, and it was like, Hey, this isn't. And, and when I qualified for sections, I, I told my dad why I didn't want to go uh, you know, I don't want to finish out. I was the only middle schooler and we actually had a different locker room. So I was going to be the only kid walking over from the middle school. And it was like, hundred yards through the hallway, but still, I'm like, I don't want to go alone. And the pool sucks. And my dad said, if you, when you told the coach that you were going to be on the team, you committed to this and this is part of the commitment to finish. And, and he, and he basically said, you, you have to do it. 
But in the meantime, he was also going in, he got pool samples, he was talking to the janitors, he drove that like three towns over that water sample to get it tested, and they got the water fixed. And, and what I love about that story is that I wasn't allowed just to give up because something was hard. Like, yeah, it sucked. And we were coughing a little bit from like the high chlorine level or whatever it was, who knows what it is now. But that lesson as an eighth grader, that what that taught me, that was just, it was invaluable. And I, I think back to that all the time. And my dad, it was probably something part of his normal thing. Like, Hey, you, you signed up for this. Like you got to finish. And, you know, having that dinner conversation that that was probably nothing for him, but here I am all these years later that it's like, when you start something like you can't just give up because it it's, it's hard. And I, I don't know how to tell you this, but like having a lot of money is really hard. Not having money is really hard. All the thing, like life it's is hard. Life is it gets, hard. You, yeah. you, get, you get more difficult challenges, Correct. Correct. right? Whoops, Most I just definitely. lost you. So um, sorry about that. So, so it's, you get all these challenges. And I think what's really important is you have to become big enough to handle big problems. You have to continue educating yourself. And, and I think that's one thing that my parents really did well with us is they always encouraged us to keep learning and keep going. And, and so I never felt smothered by them. I always felt challenged and all of us were always expected to give our best. That was, and, and what your best was, was always, that was always good enough for sure within us. But laziness was just not accepted. That that was just all around. That was that was an excuse. What I find interesting about your swimming story is that you were also heard mm-hmm. because your father heard why you mm-hmm. didn't want to go and went to solve the, the block that was in your way. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about invaluable lessons, right, one of the keys to not giving up is identifying what the issue is and a creative ways to resolve the issue. For sure. Right. Right. And that could be as, you know, I'm a procrastinator. Well, you know, procrastination is not a thing. It's a non, it's a non thing. <laughs> right. So, so what are you doing instead? Right. Right. right? What is your avoidance um, coping, coping technique? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, is it getting on your phone and playing games? Is it playing, you know, is it, is it gaming? Is it watching TV? Is it, you know, eating, is it drinking? You know, what is your, your avoidance mechanism? That is what needs to be addressed first. Yeah. Right. And so what are you going to do instead? Um, one of the things I used to still do, I love to do is if I need to make a change, I practice first to Mm. see if it will work. Right. And my favorite story is when I decided to quit smoking. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why I decided to quit. I, you know, I don't know. But I decided that I, I knew I had certain triggers or certain things that I did that I automatically went to the cigarette. So what am I going to do instead during those moments? So I didn't just quit and then suffer through. And then I practiced. Well, will it even work? Right. right. Will it even will this distract me? Will this give me something to focus on? And every single one worked. Hmm. And then the day came. I'm like, that's it. It's over. And that was it. It was done. Awesome. Right. So you have a plan. Yes. Right. Right. And that's that is something that, I, you know, I do look like I dive in and I'm sure you do, too. Right. But I've done some thinking and some planning and some some research and some strategizing before I take the first step. But once I take that first step, I'm 100% all the way in. For sure. Right, right. And so so when we talk about making a commitment, I love to talk about commitment. This is going way off. I love it. Um, and integrity. Integrity is an interesting word. Mm-hmm. And commitment's an interesting word. I have a story um, that I don't share too often about my lesson on commitment and integrity. Hmm. I actually had a couple of situations like this before it finally went sunk into my head. Um, so I had a friend who ha- who has had a dog and she had to take a road trip for work and her sister was going to come in and dog sit. So I get a phone call and she's like, oh, my sister backed out on me and uh, can you fill in? So 
this is in Los Angeles. And I was going to an event that weekend in Los Angeles. Hmm. And I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll be at the event and, you know, you know, the timing is a little iffy, you know, you're in a, in a jam, I'll do it. I should have said no. Right. The first day was tough getting to the dog before the dog it pooped all over the place. Right. The second day I failed mm. because I was in Los Angeles and in the middle of the night is when they decide to do road work. Oh. And I could not get to that house. And the dog was crying and it pooped all over the place and neighbors had to come and it was horrible. Yeah. It was horrible. And, you know, and, and I felt awful. And meanwhile, angry because I should have said no. So I was angry at myself, not, not at her for getting confused about what integrity is. Integrity is if you feel a knee jerk reaction to say no, say no. Right. There is a reason your intuition is saying this is not the right time. Mm -hmm. I could have said, no, let's see if I can help you find someone else. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead, she was forced into a situation to find someone else because I was in classes. Yeah. She couldn't, she couldn't reach me. Right. <laughs> So, so this, this commitment thing can be a double-edged sword. Have you ever been in a situation where you made a commitment and partway through, you knew this was going to be a, a clusterfuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, boy, you're, uh, you put me in a hard spot. Um, I can't, I don't have one as great of a story as yours. <laughs> I, you know, a lot of my commitments have, it's not that intense, right? There's been times when I've like signed up for a race. The only, the only, the only one I can think of. Oh, you froze, honey. This will be easy to splice. <laughs> so the only one you can think of. Yeah. So the only one I can think of is I had, I had signed up for a race and my, my foot had, had was broke. I, I broke it. And I was like, this is, and it was actually, it was an Ironman. And I was, I, I'm like, man, this is, this is crazy. And, and I had signed up before between races and I was like, well, these little ones to get ready for that big one are not that big of a deal. And, and so I asked the doctor who was the worst doctor of all time. He's like, well, do you have any plans this summer? And I was like, well, yeah. He's like, cancel them all. You can't do anything. That's what he said. And I'm like, okay, thanks, buddy. Anyways, I said, I have a question. What can I do? And he said, you can do anything that doesn't hurt. And for me, I have a very high internal pain tolerance, but horrible external. If you pinch me, I, I will lose my mind, but I can, I can push myself internally. And so two days later, after breaking my foot, I was swimming again, pain-free. It didn't hurt to swim. And I had this dumb little boot on my foot and I was actually able to bike. I think it was about a week later, I was able to bike with a boot on and down the road. And it was an insane amount of time. It was like 24 days. I was able to run again, pain-free when you're just supposed to not move for six weeks. And I came back to like my six week thing and he like looks at my foot. And all stuff. And I didn't tell him any of this because 
yeah, he's not the nicest guy. And he goes, you have had the fastest recovery of anyone. You're, you're free to start moving about. You can, <laughs> you can walk without your cast on. And I, I said, sounds, sounds good. And of course, my mom was kind of nervous about that, but I was able to complete that race. And, but what I was ready to do was I was ready to do that race on crutches if I had to, because I had signed up for it. And, and for me, sharing those commitments with people around you and writing your goals down. And I'm not as active on social media as I once was, but what I used to do is I would put it on Facebook. I am signed up for this race. Right. Does anyone want, does anyone want to do it with me? Right. So then you see your aunt Susie or whoever it is. And they're like, Daniel, are you, how's the race going? And how's training going? And blah, blah, blah. And I was at the chiropractor this morning and I'm signing up. I'm actually training for another race. It just happens to be And I can say, it's going well, here's where I'm at. And I don't have to sit here and be like, well, here's all my excuses. Because I have all these people that are, they don't even realize it, but they're holding me accountable. And and accountability is such a huge part of of becoming a person who has integrity and all those things, right? Like just doing what you say you're going to do. You've got all these people along the way that are holding you accountable. So for me, I think it's, I'm sure there's a lot of ways, like my wife was here, she could probably tell you, Gail, a lot of examples of times that I've (laughs) fallen short. (laughs) <laughs> but I, and maybe I, maybe I'm just, uh, I, I don't quite can't bring them up, but um, I think I've, the dishes haven't quite made it to the dishwasher a few times at, at my house. But, um, but I think it's extremely important that from a very young age, what I realized is that there's always a way and it, it might not be really comfortable. It might not be easy, but you can always figure out a way. You got to talk to one more person. You got to read one more book. You got to do a little more research, dive a little deeper. And you can always figure out a way to get something done. You know, and, and, and I love that. So I just wrote down, there's always a way. And I think that is an advantage that you got Mm -hmm. because um, there's, there's always a gift in trauma and tragedy, Mm -hmm. right? And yes, it was devastating. I'm sure for your family to lose a child at 18 days, was it 18 18 days, 18 days, 18 days. Um, But that put a fire in their heart mm-hmm. and that fire in their heart was a gift yeah. that all of your, your siblings received. Right. Yeah. Right. What, what's really to add a little more detail to that accident, Gail, you know, my mom had, was driving down the road and, and in the mid to late eighties, car seats weren't a thing. Seatbelt laws didn't exist. All these things like that, that some of us today, like, like what, there's no way. But my, yeah, my brother at 18 days old, he wasn't in a car seat. My cousin wasn't even strapped in. And and a, there was another 16 year old driver coming down the road and we lived on a gravel road. And at the time the corn was high enough in late July that they couldn't see each other and it had just rained. And so they collided and, and everyone died except for my mom. And and she broke her pelvis, her back, her femur, all this stuff. And so the, the, the fear of having another kid, but at, in, in her heart, she knew that she owed it to future society. There's a reason why she survived. Right. And, and, and what is it that she needs to have done to justify that? And I, and I think only she really knows that, but from the outside looking in, I can tell you she's done a lot. She's worked her tail off and, and the, the fruits of her efforts, of the, the, the people that she's publicly spoken to and privately mentored and all these things because when you're when you're laying there in the hospital in her words and and you're in a full body cast basically and you're the only survivor you just lost your 18 day old son there's a lot of questions as to why right and you know why why did i survive why why was an 18 day old soul taken you know and 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 a lot of those things that are i can't even imagine the to what to go through but the way that she took took a spin on that and i i just look back and I think of the way that we were raised as kids and, and how competent we all are and, and the fact that we were loved every single day, our, our entire lives. And we were, we were, we were allowed to fail safely. We were allowed to be challenged. We, and we were allowed to be disciplined. I, I think that is, is so extremely important for any parent that it's, it's okay to put your phone down and spend time with your kids. It's okay to tell them, no, it's healthy. It's, it's healthy to encourage them and motivate them. All these things that I think a lot of people try to really like, try to do it just perfect. And it's like, just love your kid. That's, that's what you really got to do. You got to love them. And, and I was so fortunate, fortunate to receive what I feel is like an extra abundance of love. And I, I'm so thankful for that extra love that I received because what it's given me today and the way that I raise my kids and, and the way that I view my 
day-to-day life and my marriage and the way that I view the length of time of like, I'm not going to wait to do it. I'm, I'm not going to wait till I'm 65 to do this or do that because like, you never know what's going to happen. And, and having that perspective on life of getting rid of procrastination and all these things and to set those goals and go get it done. It's, it's benefited me in every aspect of my entire life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and I wrote down, I think we're going to call this, you know, there's always a way, mm-hmm. right. Um, and I have, uh, and honestly, that has been my success in corporate, my mm-hmm. success as a consultant for large businesses, um, and my success as a, a, you know, empowerment master. Mm-hmm. I look at the possibilities. There's always a way, right? You just, first of all, need to know what it is that you really desire. Mm-hmm. Is this really your desire or is it what someone says you should desire? Right. Right. Because there is definitely a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things your environment allowed you to do was explore your desires. Yes. Right. 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 So um, I have to say, Daniel, this did not go where we thought it was going to go, but I am thrilled. (laughs) Yeah, I always enjoy it. You know, you never know what you're going to talk about, the educational system or trauma or, or business goals. But but yeah, it's amazing. I think it's it, what's really unique is how it all kind of comes together. These these small decisions that you make every single day, they they are really a path that take you down left or right. And pretty soon you can end up significantly different than where you thought. And and I think like, you know, for us, uh, you know, a father of a young family, we're discussing, do we homeschool our kids? Or how do we raise them? You know, how how hard do I push my little two and a half year old son when he says I can't or whatever, you know, things like that. And it's it's a really fun challenge we're not perfect but we're giving it your best and i think just having the intention of just saying out loud like i want to be a good dad you're going to be better than most of the dads like if you want to be a good teacher a good whatever it is you know a good juggler you're going to be one of the best jugglers in the world just by having that intention and i and i think that a lot of people don't give themselves credit for that you know just being intentional yes being in, being intentional and um and and looking for a way, mm-hmm. right? Because if you're in, intentional, if if it's again back to the desire, if it's it's your desire, then you have the will. Mm-hmm. And if you have the will, then the way will come. It, it's kind of like Simon Sinek's why, right? Mm-hmm. right? Right, right. You For don't sure. need to know how, right? Right. You 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 don't. Be, be, you just need to to see what do I need to do today. That that's my thing. Now. It's when I wake up, I have a vision kind of about where I'm going to be in a year from now. Um, and I just get up every morning and say, what do I need to do today to, to drive me towards that? Yeah. What is it that I need to do today? For right. Sure. And, you know, small steps, small steps get you there. And yeah. um, intentionality, consistency. Right. right? Um, and discipline. Yes. Yeah. Daniel, I just adore you. I think you're fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I, it's always a pleasure to be on here with you. And and yeah, I appreciate it too. It's 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 always fun to have to be able to have a conversation with someone and, and it, you keep up you have a lot in common where you can talk about all these different things. And I think you and I see, I think we see it the the world through a very similar lens. Right. It's unusual. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you. how can people get in touch with you, Daniel? Um, yeah. if, if they want to know more about your business, if they want to know more about you and, and intentionality. Yeah. F- follow me on LinkedIn. Um, you could add me there. It's just Daniel Felt. My company is Cura Home, K-U-R-A-H-O-M-E. We have a lot of unique services there. So I always love to connect with people. I personally manage my LinkedIn. So add me there. You can follow us on social media. We post quite a few times each day. So uh, you might learn a thing or two about maintaining your house. Aha! Fantastic. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Empowering Process podcast. And my my guest, which was quite interesting with Daniel Felt. And if this was of interest to you, please do let us know. Give us a thumb up. If a question came up, by all means, comment, and we would be happy to get back in touch with you. If you know somebody who could benefit from this conversation, because it was a strange one, absolutely do share it out because we love to impact lives. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day. We love you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Empowering Process Podcast. Be sure to visit Gail at gailcraft.com to learn more about how she serves thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and goal seekers. And remember, 
If you like this broadcast, be sure to share and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.